Amen. So the title is Pride and Prejudice, as you can see. Um, and um, I want to jump right into, uh, this kind of flows right out of the Sunday sermon that I preached last Sunday, but and, and you'll see why, you know, because the first thing I think I want to address is why, why, why do we even need to study something like this? Why is this important? Now, to some of us, it's incredibly obvious, and and it's more of a gosh, finally, we're 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 actually discussing things that affect our lives. And to others of us, it might be a little bit like, okay, but why, 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 why do we need to keep talking about this, or why is this, you know, such a big deal? Um, and that's what we're the first thing I want to address um, in uh, John chapter eleven, verse thirty-two. <clears throat> says, when Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Um, now, you know the situation. Jesus is, is already, he's friends with Mary and Martha and their brother Lazarus, and and um, they're good friends of his, and, and he's coming back towards Jerusalem, and he goes through their town, and and um and but he but on his way he hears about Lazarus death and he does not he doesn't get up and go yet he actually spent, takes a couple more days and then he comes into town and this is what uh Mary is pleading to him why why didn't you come this is this uh you could have saved my brother um and when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. And what I want to point out with this is that uh, what you what we see, we learn so much about Jesus' heart right here. It says that he, when he saw her weeping and the Jews that had come along with her also weeping, when he saw everybody crying, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. I want you to just think about that for a second. That I mean, this is Jesus. He knows he's going to resurrect Lazarus in just a few minutes. He knows he has the power to raise him from the dead. They'll be having dinner together that night. So it isn't about his friend dying. It isn't about Lazarus dying. There's something else here moving him. He sees Mary and Martha. He sees them weeping. He sees their friends weeping, crying, hurting. And, you know, when somebody we're close to dies, that's a deep hurt. That's a that's a hurt that is, it, it almost is without words. That, that's when you hurt so deep, you, you groan. You, you, you're just in such deep pain. And I've, I've lost people that I'm very close to and, and uh, all too familiar with that level of pain. And many of you have gone through that. Or you bury somebody you love deeply, and it's just a very deep, deep pain and suffering. And it's so absolute and it's so intense. But what is so intense about this situation, well, first of all, this isn't this isn't Jesus' family. They're not his family. In one sense, there isn't a normal reason to be so emotionally invested in them. I mean, they're his friends, and he knows them a little bit. I wouldn't even say they're his best friends. They didn't travel with him. They weren't going through everything with him. They were people he spent time with a couple of times. But when he sees them, he's deeply disturbed in his spirit. He's moved. He's troubled. And he says, where have you laid him? And he asked, Come and see, Lord, they replied, and Jesus wept. Shortest English scripture in the whole Bible, but tells us so much about Jesus. that He hurt with those that were hurting. He was in pain because of their pain. That's a radical empathy, a radical compassion, that he would feel what the suffering person feels. When we hurt, he hurts. And remember, we just been studying the book of John. How many times Jesus talked about inviting us into a relationship with him as his relationship with the Father is, that they were one, that we would be one with him, that we would be one with each other. In other words, that we're so close 
that we share our pains, we share our hurts. And he modeled that. But the fact that he wept for no other reason that he was hurting because they were hurting. He was suffering because they were suffering. And 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 later on we also well actually it was earlier but but we also see him in another scene where he's coming into Jerusalem and he sees Jerusalem and he weeps over Jerusalem. When he sees the helpless, they're harassed, he sees their lostness and it hurts him. And to love somebody that deeply, that much. And that's that's Jesus. And thank God because we have our hurts and we want God to know and we and and how good it is to know that God not only is aware of our hurts but he hurts when we hurt and that's the relationship that he's inviting us into a relationship with him that's that close that we share we share our love we share our blessings we also share our burdens and our pains and that's why it's so important that what happens to one of us needs to matter to all of us. I think we feel it sometimes when when a friend loses somebody and we see them crying and it hurts us because we hate to see them cry. We say we hate to see them in pain. We get it as parents. As parents, we wish so much that we could do something to prevent our kids from suffering. And no matter what we do, we try everything to prepare them for life. But when they suffer, it we suffer. It hurts. There's a, there's a saying that a, a parent is only as happy as their saddest child. And we carry their burdens. We carry the weight, their, their hurts, their sorrows, their tears. We feel it. And why? Because we love each other. So we love our kids so much. And the people we're close to that we've invested that much love, we feel. So in the body of Christ, of course, Paul teaches it very clearly. When one part suffers, every part suffers. So what what matters to one should matter to all of us. That's love. Love always protects, right? That's the very first line out of the 1 Corinthians 13 line. Love always protects where, where we feel for each other. We don't just disconnect from one another. We're connected. So where pain happens, we all feel it. If my foot gets hurt, the rest of the body didn't go, oh, well, too bad. Hope you get better. We're cutting you off. No, we feel it. The whole body reacts to that. And that's a healthy body. And that's the way the church should be. So in this thing that's happening in our world right now, where our African-American brothers are in so much pain and so much hurt, and rightly so, we should all carry it. We should all feel it. We should all want to know and understand. And, And it's not natural. It's not natural. This is supernatural. This is God love. This is agape love. It's spiritual And we come to this kind of love and this kind of relationships through the Spirit of God, through God, not through the world. We know what the world is like. The world is divide and divisions and prejudice and and, and self-righteousness and judgmentalism and condemnation. But not so the kingdom of God, not the body of Christ. We love each other. We care about each other. So when one part hurts, every part hurts. So when we see our brothers and sisters in pain, no matter who they are, no matter what their background, no matter what color skin they are, no matter what language they speak, it should hurt us. When we see what's happening in Hong Kong, when we see what's happening with refugees, when we see, and you can say, well, those aren't in our church. Yeah, they were. We lost a brother and sister who drowned trying to cross the Mediterranean, fleeing as refugees. We've had brothers stabbed for their faith. We, we, we are the body. We should all feel that in different countries, in different places. So 
So something that affects us or a part of us, we all need to care about that. And that's good. That's that's a beautiful thing when we're that committed to one another, when we love each other that much. So, so this is an attempt to help us become a little more aware and understand a little more. This is a subject that Honestly, I've spent many years chewing on, many years thinking about, praying about, studying about, thinking about it because of my own experience growing up here, which is not the same as an African-American person's, but there are some similarities. And in one sense, you know, growing up with an Irish father and a very Mexican family, I, I, I see both sides. I see many sides and I see many different views and, and the 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 experience that God has given me in the neighborhoods I've grown up has allowed me to get a lot of different perspectives. I believe that God gave me all these different experiences so that I can be a champion for love and for justice. I mean, half my life growing up as a kid, I lived in predominantly African American neighborhoods or Hispanic neighborhoods. And, and my best friends were always all over the spectrum, including growing up with a white father. And so I had a lot of different views on this. And even so, I had to wrestle through a lot of my own pain. And I would absolutely testify that Jesus got me through it. Jesus helped me to really be set free of it. And, and I think, I believe that God gave me experiences so that I could share with others and help others, both when we need to understand, when we need to be patient, when we need to grow, and, well, that's it. So here's the basic outline. We're going to identify some of the issues, understand some of the dynamics, understand each other, hopefully, find solutions for change, and take intentional action to grow and move forward. Um, obviously, boy, is there a lot going on in our world right now. Obviously, people are mad. You know, we got the COVID thing happening in the background, all, a global pandemic. That's that's this. That's all these people that you're seeing marching. That's what they're marching about, is they want to get out of their houses and start everything up. While other people who aren't marching are at home saying, hey, hang on. We, you know, you're, you're endangering all of us. You're endangering my dad. You're endangering me. You're endangering my grandma. You're endangering my family. And so there's all that going on in the background. And this is spreading all over the world. I mean, even this weekend, there were massive protests in Paris and London and Australia and France and uh, or Spain all over the place. And of course, what we've had in our own country happening nightly. And then, of course, on top of that, there's been the explosion of looting and robbing, and and that's added to our anger on all sides. Everybody's mad about that. There's a lot happening out there. There's a lot of just painful stuff happening out there. And I believe in the kingdom of God, we can be an example we can find a way to first heal and to be able to show the world the way out. Why? Because we have Jesus. And he is the way and the truth and the life. He is. But it, it, it means we have to grow some. It means we have to understand some things. It means we have to learn some things. And, and that means we have to care enough to try. The easiest thing is just to tune it out either because we feel like it's not going to be enough to solve things or because we feel like, hey, that wasn't me. I didn't do that. Leave me alone. We have to care enough to want to listen, to want to learn, to want to understand, and to want to grow. And this thing, you know, it runs deep. There's a long history of prejudice, racism, really in our whole world, but we're dealing particularly with our own country 
of different feelings, different things. There's a long history of prejudice, a lot of wounds that run deep. And, and some of this stuff goes way back, but understand that a lot of this is what's happening right now, not just what happened 100 years ago or 200 years ago, but what's where are things at right now? And I think that's particularly where our greatest area is that we have to grow and learn and understand more because it's not so visible right now. It's not so obvious until something like this happens, like what happened to George Floyd. Then all of a sudden, boom, everybody's saying, see? And others are saying, what? And I pray that we're going through a change, a real change this time. I've never seen so many people in uproar. I've never seen so many people marching. And such a wide swath of kinds of people. And I hope that means we're all taking this on together. I saw a picture of the Amish out there protesting. The Amish people carrying their signs, Black Lives Matter. I thought, if they're out there, then would anybody who isn't moved to help to be part of the solution, to do something positive? Um, the root of it is, I, I believe, is xenophobia. What is that? Well, it's fear of strangers, fear of those who are different. I think that's a lot of where this comes from. I think that xenophobia leads to prejudice and to racism and to discrimination. I think those are those are rooted in xenophobia, the fear of foreigners or the fear of what is different, you know, that what we don't understand, what we don't get. That's how in the 1800s, when the United States was predominantly white, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant, and then the, in the turn of the century, all these Italians and Irish came, there was such a fear of them. They were different. They had different religion. They were Catholic. They spoke different languages. They had different culture, different norms. And people were scared, and they, and people reacted. They didn't want to hire Irish or or Italian, and and I'm, I'm and I'm picking those particular because they're also white. I remember as a little kid, I'm, I was listening to my parents talking, and they had a friends, and he was Irish and she was Italian, and they got married. They're from Boston. They had to move to California because both their families rejected their marriage. And I remember sitting in the back thinking, but they're both white. Why would they why would they not get along? They were not only both white, they were both Catholic. But it was that Irish and Italians hated each other. And they were competing in the same neighborhoods. And so this stuff runs so deep. And you say, well, and, and the reason I call it pride and prejudice is because racism is rooted in pride as well as fear. It's when you get fear and pride mixed together and you get this deadly combo where not only do I reject you because I'm afraid of you, but I also look down on you because I think I'm better than you. And that's the pride. And then there's just good old-fashioned prejudice. There's nothing good about it, but it's what it is. It's a very common thing. It's a little different than racism, and we'll go into that. And then, the, and then the outcrop of both of those is discrimination. So again, why do we need to do this? Why do we need to study this? Because we're at that point that it's time for change. And as Christians, which I think generally we've done so much better than the world, but there is still absolutely room for growth. And I think we can be a shining light to the world. But it means we have to grow together. We have to learn. I think there's things that if we would just listen to each other, and I, I know that's a scary thing. It's so scary because, and I think particularly if you're a Caucasian brother or sister, it really is scary because you're afraid somebody's going to get mad at you, so you're going to say the wrong thing. I've heard that said. You know, Michelle shared in her devotional, and, and, and I, I get that. I get that. And I'm so proud of the brothers and sisters, particularly 
in our region and uh, African American background that that the, how they've handled this spiritually, and I think that's what's going to get us. How how every group handling it spiritually is what brings us together in Christ, and we can be a light to the world. And and we need to do that. We need to show the world the difference. So here's the outline. And like I said, this is going to be, you know, probably at least a three series class. And I think we'll come out of this learning and and understanding a lot more. And I'm going to have some guest speakers that will give different perspectives. But I think if we really listen to each other, I think we can really learn a lot and and achieve a level of unity like what Jesus talked about, what he prayed for. We're not quite there yet. Those are the chapters coming up. In the next section, he prays for unity, that we would be one as the Father and he are one. And there's, there's misunderstandings that get in our way, some maybe completely unintentional. But if we, if we have the courage and the faith and the love to go there, I think great things can happen. And I think we can be at a place only in the kingdom, <laughs> only in the kingdom of God. So we'll tackle these. Um, I'm trying to keep all these to about 20, 25 minutes. So we're at 23 minutes now. I'll go ahead and stop because I'll, I'll be launching into the next section. But today, mostly just why. Why are we doing this? Because it's important to God. It's important to Jesus. And therefore, it's important to us that we learn, that we grow, that we definitely stop bad, bad, uh, bad habits. And we reach the unity that Jesus prayed for. So we'll stop there. I love you guys, and I'll see you in the next class. Thank you for joining us. I hope this has been educational and inspiring for you. If you'd like to know more, please join us by going to study.laicc.net, and we'll be happy to contact you and help you in any way we can.